to those involved in health tech innovation and improvement. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, thank you for, for coming and to our sponsors and for pizza uh, and the use of uh, this uh, facility. So what I'm going to do uh, is to introduce Josephine McMurray. Uh, so Josephine um, uh, is from Agewell uh, Drive and uh, full credit to her. She ran a workshop on Monday uh, called Making Connections Workshop, a workshop uh, together with technology to support social inclusion for older adults. Um, uh, it was done at the Lions Arena, spectacular success. Uh, I think that kind of really also kind of brings uh, people together from, again, very diverse uh, kind of backgrounds across the region. Uh, and then this uh, discussion, I think, is, is also very timely, uh, really bringing together, I think, the key players uh, from a whole across the region that are helping in uh, tech uh, development uh, for healthcare and health and well-being. So, Josephine, I'm going to uh, turn over to you, and you can, uh, I'll let Josephine introduce the individual members of the panel. Thank you, Josephine. So, um, given that this is undoubtedly one of the most innovative and fertile ecosystems for startups in Canada, um, I'm absolutely delighted to be part of the Hacking Health group. Um, in my spare time, I'm also a faculty member at the Lazarus School of Business, and uh, I teach in the Business Technology Management Program, but my passion is health, and I do my research in that area. So. Um, what we do know, um, and as part of my work that I do with the age well group, uh, we do know that this is an incredibly fertile uh, area for, uh, for developing innovative uh, technology. And we're actually one of the top three regions pretty much every year when it comes to PATS per capita. And in fact, as, uh, as, a, as an ecosystem, we rank oftentimes in the top 20 globally. So something really interesting is happening here with respect to innovation and tech, we know that. But we want to tonight talk about how this ecosystem can actually support and encourage men and health care, uh, men and uh, health tech startups. And to help them not only start, but then how do you help them scale? We have an incredibly distinguished uh, panel tonight from universities and colleges, from innovation hubs and startup accelerators, and from the local business community. So, with that, I am going to ask my esteemed colleagues to make their way to the front when I introduce them. Uh, the first person up is Chris Farrell. She is the manager of the Wilton Region Small Business Centre, and she didn't have to come because her office is over there. So, welcome, Chris. at the University of Virginia, actually, And Adrian Cote, here's Adrian, is the Science Lead and Business Advisor at Velocity. <laughs> Kelly McGregor, the Manager of Revenue Fierce Founders at Communitech and the Fresh Back from Silicon Valley. Director at the Center for Smart Manufacturing at Conestoga. You're welcome. <laughs> and Cameron Wind, who's the Programs Client Experience Manager at the Accelerator Center. Welcome, Cameron. <laughs> and then we also have, just going to make sure we've got everybody seated, great. And we also have Laura Allen, who is the Executive Director of the Slegal Center for Entrepreneurship at Laurier. this is going to be, I'm going to uh, uh, introduce some questions and in some cases I'm going to direct them specifically at some people, but I encourage you all to jump in and to add um, anything that you have to say. I think at this point, if we might, you can take note of your questions, write them down, because believe me, by the time we get to the end, you may forget. Um, so write down your questions and then we're going to leave a spot at the end for you to actually ask people generally or specifically. 
specifically uh, some of your questions. So in order to be able to reverse this a little bit, you all now know our esteemed panel. I'm wondering if I can just ask a little bit of you. So if you can identify, and you may put up your hand several times, um, how many of you are clinicians of some kind in the healthcare system or social services system? All right, great. How many of you are engineers? Aha. How many of you are computer scientists or something similar? Okay, great. How many of you are students? Terrific, welcome. How many of you are entrepreneurs who have an overabiding desire to be one? All right, fantastic. And um, how many of you have an idea but you haven't actually done anything about it yet? You're just kind of out to lurk and get a sense of, could this work? Okay, all right, marvelous. Well, hopefully we can help you out with that this evening. So um, let's get the ball rolling. We're ready to go. All right, so the first question, I'm going to aim at Adrian and Kelly. So you both see a lot of startup pitches in your programs. What percentage of those are health or med tech related? Maybe just closer, closer. sorry, thank you. Um, in about five years ago, we really saw an increase in the number of med tech companies. And, I, and that's even accelerating now. And I, I credit it to, uh, at least locally, that being driven by some things that have happened at the University of Waterloo. Uh, one was the creation of Velocity Science, which is an on-campus program where students can access lab space and start to explore uh, their ideas of product development and many of those students come in uh, really wanting to solve problems that are important to them and often they're based in, in health related. Uh, and of course there's also Greenhouse, there's also uh, some other programs at the University of Waterloo, degree programs that are inspiring this as well. Um, so over time, just to give you some numbers now, five years ago we'd be hard pressed to say that there is a single med tech company in Velocity. Now, of the roughly 90 companies in the Boston portfolio, 20 of them are in the life sciences med tech space. So that's a really encouraging sign. And, and as of, uh, as of uh, a couple months ago, we've now launched three companies in that space from Boston. From Boston, from yeah. okay. And when you say launched, does that mean launched locally or? Uh, ab abroad and locally. So okay. uh, I think. Uh, now, the two most recent launches are, are, are local, uh, and they're now independent, self-sustaining companies, uh, and they're building lab space, they're building offices in the core of one of their That's very good to hear. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to come back to that a little bit later and ask the two of you some knock-on questions to that, uh, but I wonder if I could turn to Chris now. And um, so what sort of resources uh, does the Waterloo region have that could support health and medtech startups from your perspective? Yeah, so we have some programming that supports uh, small businesses and that is, includes health and maybe not so much tech. I would say 
um, at the Small Business Center, we would work more with practitioners. And um, so, like pharmacists who are starting a business, uh, naturopath doctors, so a little more alternative. Um, and in our programming, uh, we'll take them through uh, learning to operate the business, like that sort of thing. Also, we have a large network of mentors who can help them when they get stuck on you know, operations or regulations or industry standards, those kinds of things. And, uh, and then some, because these practitioners a lot of times start out as sole proprietors, um, we take them through a lot of marketing and sales programming as well. Okay, and is that where you find most people need the additional help? Totally. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. That's so any advice out there to those who are thinking about, you know, starting on Yeah, business? so we actually have three locations here in City Hall and in uh, the Waterloo City Hall and also in Cape Ridge. And, I mean, you can just contact us by email or drop in and, uh, and we can get you started and kind of triage you through and get you into the right program. Marvelous. Okay. So, uh... Next up is Laura and Nick. Uh, so uh, you want to uh, grab a microphone if you don't have one. So my questions to you are, are this. So you run highly successful innovation hubs and startup programs on local campuses. Generation Z is entering the universities and colleges. Uh, social media and mobile tech has always existed to them. It's claimed they're smarter than baby boomers and way, way more ambitious than millennials. Can you comment on how this is impacting your programs as a result? Uh, Laura, thank you. And then uh, if, if, tell me if I can come back to you. It would be fantastic. Laura, I can take a stab. Oh, great. Right. Okay. okay. Um, we're, we're actually we're, we're partnered with a researcher um, at the University of Waterloo called um, uh, the Project is Youth Innovation Project. And uh, the head researcher there, her name is Alona Dorley, and she's done some in-depth research on the human brain and innovation and creativity. And what she's found is that, um, and sorry for folks that are over 25, this is bad news for you, uh, but between the ages of 14 to 25, we're the most creative and innovative in our entire lives, right? And, and so um, I think, Part of this is sort of starting to realize and, and further unlock the potential of young people. Um, and we're doing some work in that space now where we're actually working with organizations to embed um, students into um, nonprofits to determine, you know, how do we bring innovation into some of these organizations? And it's interesting because there's a there's a culture clash, right? Um, young people want to blow things up and say, like, why are we doing it this way? We should, you know, like, let's completely overhaul this. Um, and then um, folks in the workplace are like, <gasps> right? So we're kind of managing that kind of tension where we have to, um, how do we empower and create pathways for this energy and this, these new ideas um, at the same time um, help them realize that um, they have to meet people where they're at and kind of move change forward that way. So, yeah, they want to see things happen and they want to see it happen fast. And so we're trying to create, create those pathways so that they don't get discouraged. Okay. Terrific. Hey, do you want to have a crack yeah. at that one? Uh, can everybody hear me? I'll use my professor voice here. Um, I think at the college, uh, we, we see a lot more of the millennials actually getting into uh, uh, potential entrepreneurship than we do the, the what we call Gen, Gen Z or whatever that label is for the, the younger uh, uh, students entering uh, post-secondary. Um, one of the things we see at the college is that, again, students are either coming in to get vocational training so that they can get the job right away, or they've taken something at a university, it hasn't worked out, and they come back to the college to specialize in something that will get them the job. And what we're starting to see is, again, some of these students, so, so I can point out one of our students on the floor here, uh, Tarek, uh, he graduated with a biology degree, came back and, and earned an uh, advanced diploma in electronics, and now he's an entrepreneur, uh, uh, working through our Center for Entrepreneurship and our Center for Smart Manufacturing, developing uh, a, tele a telepresence robotic solution for, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, personal support worker type environments and so forth. So again, it's that 
I think what we're seeing is that students that, that are gravitating towards entrepreneurship are more likely to have come back to the college to get that specialization. And then they realize, this is where I can see the applications of, of their ideas, uh, more so than the students coming fresh out of high school. But I will uh, say that uh, I run a, a yearly entrepreneurship hackathon every February during the uh, school's reading break. And definitely the participation in that hackathon is the students in first and second year. So they've got the ideas, they just don't know where to take them to that next level. Perfect segue for you, Laura. Yeah, um, I most likely don't need this either. <laughs> um, I would be too loud, I think. Um, I, I would echo what you're saying. They're incredibly smart. They know more than we do. You, you were mentioning social media, mobile technology. Um, our biggest challenge is to have the mentorship for them that will understand it at the level they understand it and can support them. Um, and uh, we, we actually have an incredible amount of momentum in terms of students coming in and wanting to be entrepreneurs. Our classes um, are jammed. One that I have right now, an ideation class, is at fire code level, um, it, it's, and they fill up uh, very, very quickly, and they are way past what our understanding of those things are, so keeping up with that is really important, but in terms of, you mentioned social media, we have students who are coming into our launch pad who are, their entire businesses are focused on that, um, supporting um, businesses and creating content and strategy or we're helping them find and harness influencers. And uh, we even have two, you mentioned mobile technology, that are in the health, uh, it's a, a health application, mobile application. Um, so we're seeing a lot more um, in that area, but it, they're all using it. There isn't a single one that isn't using technology in some way uh, or another. Just, just to jump in quickly on this Please one. Do. Um, to, for the students that are in the audience here, and uh, you're doing exactly the right thing, no matter what institution you're at in, in town, Kitchener Waterloo is an amazing place to start a company. Um, go find whatever resource exists at your institution, and I'm sure they'll do your best to try and try and get you to the next step. Um, part of that is is getting onto events like this and just keep asking questions. It, this is a community bar, not where it's a great place to start a company. Yeah, and I would say do it now while you're in that mm -hmm. ecosystem. Um, because once you're out of it, it's tough, you lose that support and it's strong. Terrific, thanks. Um, Ig, I'm gonna come back to you just for one short, uh, sort of question related to sort of physical products. Um, so for those that have ideas that involve physical technology that require access to resources such as in the industrial design, prototype development, small scale manufacturing, what kind of resources are available in the community and what kind of advice would you offer to those kind of innovators in MedTech? And maybe I'll come back to you as well because I know at the Velocity offices. So uh, at least in the, in the context of Conestoga College, uh, uh, when we look at our various programs, say maybe electronics or software engineering or IT programs and so forth, uh, part of the requirements for every graduate is that they have to do a capstone project. So in, in some of our programs, especially our IT-related programs, we actually run pitch events uh, on a semester basis where we invite industry in, and that could be, again, any entrepreneur who's got an idea to pitch an idea to our students, and our students then will go after and bid on the project opportunities that have been presented. And then over the next four months or eight months, depending on the length of the capstone project uh, uh, courses within their program, the students can then develop a proof of concept, an early stage prototype, a minimum viable product, those sorts of things on behalf of our industry partners. So it's an absolute win-win for our students as well as our industry partners, because industry partner essentially gets, I won't say free, because they don't want to uh, promote it as free labor, but the students don't have to be paid for this, they're being paid in terms of their academic results. Um, and at the same time, the industry partner is getting value out of the uh, students' participation. Uh, in their projects. The caveat, do not ever, ever give students mission critical work because <laughs> students have the right to fail. So uh, if they don't do the work, they don't, uh, don't generate the results, they may have to repeat that capstone course and you might be out for eight months worth of time. So again, it's back burner kind of stuff, but it's really great in terms of, again, especially if you're an early stage uh, entrepreneur and you don't have the cash and you're not eligible for funding, for research uh, funding and so forth, 
let the students uh, uh, give a hand at uh, innovation on your behalf. Adrian. So maybe I can speak to the, uh, the post-education resources. Uh, and again, from the Velocity perspective, um, we were able to offer free space for doing biotechnology research, chemistry research, and I say research, but I really mean product development. So biotech product development, we have lab spaces for that, we have chemistry spaces, we have assembly spaces, places to do hardware prototyping um, that we offer for free. And I think that's one of the real differentiators uh, that we can offer in this, in this community is that we can remove that overhead that exists in sort of the first two years of the company to develop um, develop your products, whereas otherwise you'd be paying a, a very large amount per square foot to have access to lab space. Um, so it's a real, real coup for, I believe, this, this, this community to be able to have access to something like that. In, in regards to, you know, getting prototypes built, short run manufacturing, whether it's under a quality system or not under a quality system, uh, again, I think if you reach out to uh, the, the, the partners in town that support, support startups, so that's Velocity, Communitech, Accelerator Center, get into those networks. You have a lot of great knowledge from people that have been through building startups, uh, that have come from industry or large corporations that have those connections that can make intros to the right manufacturers, to the right people to get that done as efficiently as possible. Fantastic advice, thank you. Cameron, you're not forgotten. So, by all accounts, Canada has struggled to help a startup scale here. I wonder if you could comment on that first, generally, and then perhaps speak to what programs or available support or advice you have for high potential startups um, in this region with respect to growth. Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's certainly an interesting question. Um, I would say unanimously across the board, startups face three challenges. I mean, not just three, but three large ones. Um, yeah, customers, uh, capital, and talent. Um, and I would say that uh, based on my experience at the Accelerator Center and the, the clients that I've dealt with, um, you see a lot of uh, companies going to the uh, United States and getting access to capital much easier than they would here in Canada. That's not really a secret. Um, and same with customers, we've seen a number of companies uh, struggle to uh, integrate with the Canadian healthcare system. It's much quicker uh, in the United States as you're seeing um, innovation happen much quicker and the, the stakeholders willing to accept a, a much higher degree of risk. Um, so from those two standpoints, yeah, the, it's, it's definitely a challenge for some medtech companies in Canada, but what I will say is that in, degree, uh, in terms of talent here in Canada, and specifically Kitchener-Waterloo, there is an absolute abundance of talent in this region. Um, and not only is there a lot of people, but uh, it's extremely collaborative here. So it's a, it's a huge advantage, um, and I can speak to it firsthand based on my experience with, with companies that we've helped at the Accelerator Center. Um, it's a huge advantage for Canadian and tech companies. Um, the other thing I'll say is, uh, as far as programs and how we, we help companies here, we've certainly identified that those challenges are, are real and they exist. Um, and what I really like about Kitchener-Waterloo and what attracts me to this region specifically is I get to work with people at Commutatech, Velocity, and we've identified that these are challenges and we're trying to find new ways to help medtech companies in this region, re region solve those problems. So we're, you know, we're reaching out to other people um, outside of KW, you know, Hamilton, Toronto, and figuring out how they have solved these problems. Um, and if, if we can duplicate you know, their models or integrate with, it, with their models and resources, then we're trying to help the startups do that. So, um, that's really what we're doing right now to help some of the companies. And, and at the Accelerator specifically, um, a one huge resource, is that one resource that we leverage is when we can, we, we pull on our, our graduate companies. So um, some of our companies that are facing challenges, if we can pull on some of our successful graduates over the last 12 years, well, almost 12 years, um, to help them you know, solve some of the same challenges, uh, it's been a huge success for some of our, our, our recent companies. So, with that in mind then, I wonder if you could just sort of comment on what you think some of the special challenges are that those particular companies are facing um, in MedTech. I mean, you've, you've mentioned a number of things around customers, capital, talent, but is there anything that people themselves, the founders, can do that will position them better for success? 
Um, like the first thing that comes to mind, and I kind of touched on it previously, but it is really like spread your roots and, and, and touch base with everyone possible in the ecosystem. You know, if you're a Velocity client, if you're a Community Tech client, if you're an AC client, like really try and pitch your problem to as many founders in the region as you possibly can, because chances are someone else has solved some of the same problems that you're facing. Um, and that's a huge advantage of this region. I've talked to a number of startups that, you know, uh, like, like through this startup visa program, for example, I've talked to a number of companies from the United States who are just blown away by the, the level of collaboration in the region um, and, and don't take it for granted. So that's something that certainly comes to mind within Kitchener Waterloo. Great, thank you. And, and perhaps I can throw it open in generally to the, the, the panel. Uh, if we're thinking particularly about MAD and how it can, are there some things that, uh, that uh, the founders or the companies themselves have done that have really contributed to making them more successful? Something that's just made them step above the crowd? Kelly? So I have four very defined criteria that I'm looking for in a med tech company. And the two are something I, two of them are something I look for in companies across the board. It's, are you actually solving a problem? Um, and does your solution meet that problem? But also, do you, is, is your, in MedTech, is your solution backed by research? And do you have clinical partnerships? So do you have professionals behind you who are testing your software or your hardware um, or whatever it is you're working on? Is it in the field and people are using it and testing it and you're seeing results? Fantastic. Uh, just, yeah. just, just to build on that, I think I completely agree uh, that the, the Life sciences or med tech companies, and those are two distinct segments. Uh, uh, and at the risk of overgeneralization, access and, and, and finding a clinician that has the capacity and willingness to be very innovative and work with that company at all stages of, of the product development uh, so that you can nail the product definition and really get at the clinical value of the product you're trying to build. Because with that, you're able to understand how you can make an impact, not just from a patient benefit point of view, but also from a business point of view. You'll, you'll have the confidence to figure out the, the regulatory pathway, to figure out the reimbursement strategy, to figure out when's the right time to build a QMS system. All those things are, 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 are difficult to understand, and the sooner you can kind of figure that out uh, at, this, at the earliest stages of the company, the more efficient you can move forward. Um, the other side of it too, and has been touched on before, is uh, access to capital. Um, of the companies that I see in, in Velocity currently uh, in, in this space, it is undeniable that participation in an accelerator south of the border in places where you have really great access to clinicians that is completely devoid of red tape, not that it's, that it's anything uh, untoward or illegal or, or anything like that, but just as much of the red tape as all those barriers have been brought down, and you're in regions of the world where deep capital pools where people are willing to make bets on big technologies, undoubtedly you can, you can be, that is a short circuit to being successful and setting yourself up to get to those clinical trials and, and ultimately scaling in the market. Fantastic. Uh, Tanya, if I can come to you now and perhaps ask the flip side of this, what do you think is some of the most common mistakes that people are making when they're starting a med or health tech business? Yeah, they, they jump to the idea right away, I would say, in general. Um, so we see a lot of the nature of greenhouses, it's very much like seeding your ideas before it even emerges as, as an idea. We're there to kind of help students navigate and figure out what's the problem that they're trying to solve. And um, we've had a lot of like fourth year capstone projects come through and they've already got something built, right? And then they wanna go out there and, and test it and they figure out that the world doesn't want that product or service. So what we've done as a result to try and improve the quality of ideas that emerge early on is, is develop more of these engagements where we open up our space, invite in, not only healthcare practitioners, but also people that are living with a variety of health ailments, right? So to give a little shameless plug, um, on September 28th and 29th, we're hosting Hack for Health, and there we're asked the big question of how do we improve quality of life for people that are living with dementia or MS? 
And folks that are going to be participating in that lab-based activity are people that are living with MS and dementia, um, also caregivers, right, family members that are trying to navigate that space, as well as members of the healthcare um, process, practitioners, etc. The reason we do that is to then create pathways for our students to really drill down and say, like, what are the gaps here? What is needed, right? And go right to the source, those folks that are accessing the healthcare system or trying to access the healthcare system and are finding that they're falling through the cracks in some way. So I think the more we can do to um, get to like upstream, right, before the idea even emerges, right, um, and create opportunities for people to engage in those problems, I think it's going to improve the quality of ideas that then come through the rest of the ecosystem. Fantastic. Anybody else want to add to that? No? Okay, great. So let's uh, move to Chris again. Chris, some of the strongest criticism of the health and medtech sector is uh, they're difficult to navigate and they have very difficult regulatory environments. So do you have any advice for folks who are starting out on their journey through that particular sector or those sectors? Uh, again, I think it goes back to collaboration. Um, it is hard to navigate a lot of the regulations in health and med tech. Um, but we have so many resources and resourceful people in our community. You can find an expert pretty easily just by asking questions. And I think sometimes people don't ask enough questions or share their ideas with enough people because maybe they think somebody's going to take the idea. <laughs> it's, it's kind of redundant. But I think, um, yeah, so I think if you reach out to other experts in your field of work, um, and if you need to, maybe even a consulting firm, um, but don't try and navigate Health Canada on your own. <laughs> it's pretty difficult. I wonder if we can go back to that idea sort of of the generic balance between networking and sharing and keeping your uh, intellectual property intact. So does anybody have any comments that, because that's, that's an incredibly fine line that people walk. Does anybody have any comments or advice from people on how they do that? Um, talk about the what's, not the how's initially. So don't be afraid to talk about what your technology is going to do. Um, odds are no one's going to really steal your idea, uh, especially if you're talking in this community. Uh, at, at the end of the day, it's very difficult to copy someone really quickly. So when I talk about the what's, I'm talking about you know, what your product is going to do, what your therapeutic is, is going to achieve, a rough idea of how it works. But you don't have to get into the nitty gritty of how the subsystems are put together or how you formulate that particular drug or, or anything like that. So that's enough information to kind of unlock the next step in the discussion. That's the way we generally advise. Any other comments? No? Okay, great. So this is a general question for, for all of you. Um, and so are there things that you think are, that we need to bolster as a community that will build capacity for everybody generally, um, but also specifically in the health and the med tech sector. So what are we not doing, um, and what do we need to do as a community to be able to do that? So that's an open for anyone on the panel. I've got, I've got one that isn't necessarily for, for med tech, but it's, okay, go ahead. it's, yeah. it's funny because I feel like I've heard this answer on like the other side in the audience, but now I'm on the <coughs> panel and I'm telling everyone the exact same thing. But yeah, based on a lot of you know mutual friends within the, the Kitchener Waterloo startup community, some clients that I've talked to, uh, you know they'll go down to the valley to get access to capital, and they'll always come back saying the same thing: if you are in Canada and you are not thinking big, if you're not thinking a billion-dollar company, like do not even bother going. And I think it's it's kind of this huge issue in Kitchener Waterloo that we're not thinking big enough. So when you know when you're when you're trying to solve a problem, think of a huge problem and create an amazing solution. Um, and it's just a, a mindset that we don't necessarily have here in Kitchener Waterloo. Not that we're not solving amazing problems and creating amazing companies, but I would love to see from a you know a founder level from the startup community right now think of the the B, the billion dollar company, and, and try and solve it. So I've heard that a lot for a long time. So 
So what will make us tip over and what's required to actually help that thinking embed itself? Any thoughts, anyone? Support founders networking with each other, without doubt. I think it's all about the having the founders uh, uh, connect and have the opportunities to uh, uh, give the space to help a, a new founder with a, a seasoned founder that's gone through that exact experience. Uh, I, I think a lot of what, people ask me what I do in my day-to-day -day job, I, I would say mostly what I'm doing is, is nurturing networking and managing culture. I think that's, that's a lot of what we want to do is, is drive a peer-to-peer uh, network within within this region and and create inorganic ways to have those networks expand by uh, reaching out to the Bay Area, Boston, wherever else in the world, because um, we know that tends to unlock that type of thinking uh, that that Cam's talking about. Um, and then I think a lot of what I know Tanya and, and I do at least at University and I'm sure others is is at the earliest stages when if, if the entrepreneur entrepreneurship is, is orienting or is originating from the university is, is trying to trying to test that big thinking at the earliest stages as, as people are trying to uh, formulate you know what what problems they want to solve and the technologies they want to build um, but I think it's it's all of us sort of working together for the between that big thinking and, and really supporting peer-to-peer founder-to-founder relationships please go ahead um, just to double on that, <clears throat> I would also say, like, bring the inspiration into this community. Like, let's reach out and find those big idea people that are doing great things globally, outside of Canada. Let's invite them here to inspire our students and our, and our early stage companies to think big, right? Because if you surround yourself with people that are one level up from you, you'll kind of, you know, build that capacity, I think, to think bigger and that expand the imagination. So, not only network, but let's Let's bring some of these big idea people to this community. Fantastic. And, and, and Laura, any comments on sort of encouraging early innovators to think big? Er? <laughs> I, I'm sitting here listening to it, and, and you're not going to like my response, but I don't know if that's necessarily what everybody wants to do. Um, you might want to create an innovation-driven enterprise and you know be global, but maybe you don't. Um, so I don't think that's necessary. Um, I think we just have to um, make sure that we're supporting whatever a person wants to do, um, because I do think that we have perhaps uh, a focus in this community on on certain types of businesses and on them being. Huge, and, and, and that isn't necessarily. Uh, I think we just need to support everybody in whatever whatever direction you want to go in. Yeah, really insightful comment. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll, I'll echo that again with, with what we do at the college, especially in our areas like applied research. Uh, our mandate is to work with small to medium sized enterprises, so we're not dealing with billion dollar companies. We, in some cases, are dealing with the one man or one woman operations and trying to help them scale up to that next level where maybe now they'll have five people or ten people working within their companies. Um, like you said, it's, it's nurturing that idea and that, that, uh, that spark that gets them to that next level. And in fact, it's the diversity which has kept our ecosystem alive uh, through some of the ups and downs of, of large anchor companies, for sure. Okay, so this is, uh, I left this one to last, and I'm, I'm wondering if I can get from, from each of you some comment on this. Um, so diversity and equity issues have been really challenging in some startup ecosystems, and particularly in the tech sector. I wonder if uh, some of you, and I'm going to ask Kelly to get the ball going with this, uh, so I wonder if you could comment a little bit about diversity related to sort of gender, ethnicity, and what you're seeing, uh, what the trends are, um, what you may or might, may not be actively doing, um, and any advice you have for people who are actually in some of those sort of marginalized communities for uh, tech se sector. So the issue I'm looking at primarily is with women specifically, um, is we know that there's research that proves, there's been tons of studies out there that you can find online that show that when a woman wants to start a company 
If she goes to a male investor, he challenges her on her idea, on her plan, more than he challenges another male who's making the same assertions, right? We know that some, there are still male investors and advisors and um, so-called so supporters who are still not treating women equally. So what I'm really focusing on right now is twofold. It's how do we give women the confidence and the skills and the know-how to fight back against that, but also how do we give them the sort of network where we can help lift each other up. So how do we build out a network of all of these female founders to support each other and help each other to move beyond this? And maybe eventually we can just rely on each other until we actually face a level playing field. That was not an end statement. Please, everybody, <laughs> jump in. Yeah. Um, in our center, we're seeing a, a, a shift in, in the clientele. Um, I would say probably six or seven years ago, our clients would have been 60% men and 40% women. Um, but in the one program that we just ran, startup company, it was, uh, it really shifted. So it was 70% women taking that program and 30% men. So we're really happy to see that. And, um, but I, I do think that we, like Kelly says, we need to provide women with more support, surround them with, <coughs> with mentors and experts and uh, with a community of their own. Now was your sense that that was necessity driven or was that opportunity driven? entrepreneurs coming to you, people who sort of had no other opportunities or people who were had no, no idea? No, I wouldn't say that. I, I think it was talent driven, actually. Awesome. Yeah, so they have the skills and they have a passion for a business that they want to create and, uh, and they're doing it. That's awesome. So, Tanya, you have a lot of med and health tech companies and um, this is a health system where the workforce is dominated by women. I'm wondering if you have some comment about uh, sort of women in uh, I mean, more generally, our program, what we're seeing is <clears throat> cohort to cohort, it varies, right? It's, it, sometimes it's 50-50, it's an even split, and in some cases it's 60-40, we have more young women than, than men. And I think part of it might be because the fact that we're highly focused on developing that social impact piece with your idea, like what sort of concrete environmental or social problem are you trying to solve? And of course, healthcare fits into that. And I think in general, um, more women are attracted to that um, kind of vision, right? Of wanting to make a difference in that way. Um, I will say though that I think what's neat about this space is that the more we support young women and the more we celebrate their stories, that's going to build more momentum for other women to jump in this space. And we do a lot of work in terms of nudging our young women to go ahead and apply to the Velocity Fund Final. Get in there and do that 5K pitch. Or you know what, you have, you're ready to pitch for the 25K um, at Velocity because they feel in general like they're just not there yet, yet they've done their homework. Um, and in some cases they've done more work than our um, male students, right? So I think a lot of it is just nudging them along and saying, do it. And then as a result of them going out there from the stage and getting that you know, success, other young women are then inspired to, to jump into this, into the space as well. So, um, so that's what I'd say is we'd also not only give support, but we need to celebrate these stories and the early stories too, so that we can kind of build that momentum. <coughs> I was just thinking, we do struggle with this in another area, which is ethnic diversity. So we don't see, you know, you walk around community tech and we have lots of, you know, ethnically diverse developers, for example, but we don't have a lot of, like all of our coaches are almost entirely white men. Um, not exclusively, but there are, most of them are white men, and that is a problem. So if anyone knows anyone who is qualified to be a coach who is not a white man, I'd really like to talk to them. Because it's important to get them out there, right? Get them in front of these companies. Um, so I keep coming back to it, it sounds kind of cliche, it's stating you can't be what you can't see. It's a positive role model, for sure. Yeah, Chris, you were gonna, uh, sorry, yeah. Adrian, you were going to say something. Well, speaking as, as the Gen X white male um, advisor, I think, um, 
and I think where we are working on is being very cognizant of, of where I'm coming from and, and all these activities that, that, I'm, that I've worked towards. Um, I think everything that I'm hearing out here is, is absolutely true, and I think what we're trying to do is just do it a, do it better on, on the micro level. Um, so, for example, in, in, a, in a coaching session, like making sure that you know, this, if I'm going to suggest that an entrepreneur go speak to a, a, a founder, that uh, that make sure that top of mind is, is is a female founder and a male founder. Uh, one that represents all the cross-section of, of cultures that exist in, in this part of the world. So, um, cognizant of, of just, you know, how, what biases we bring to the table, I think is, is, at least for me, my first step. And I think I also look forward to, to feedback from, from from those that I've mentored to make sure that I can do a better job, too. So, I'm, I'm glad that these discussions happen. Thank you. That's fantastic. Any other comments on this issue? This is a great segue. We just happen to be hosting an unconscious bias event tomorrow Fantastic. at Catalyst. <laughs> um, but no, like from, from the lens of an accelerator incubator, um, one of our mentors, Jackie Lauer, who helps a lot of our companies out from an HR leadership perspective, um, like I think she does a phenomenal job coaching our, our companies um, you know, in the realm of diversity or hiring practices. Um, we, we do our best to certainly really identify the diversity it's an issue within the, the tech ecosystem. So I think from a mentorship level, Jackie's done a great job with our companies, but I can say being on the front lines and seeing a lot of applications to the Accelerator Center, like it's, it's always a, a pleasure, like a treat seeing a female founder apply to the program because generally speaking, it's uh, the applications are always very strong. So it's encouraging from I guess a younger generation. Um, seeing that a lot of people from, from you know from my generation, a lot of them are female founders, um, going through like even like through the Embed program at UW, um, the diversity was pretty strong within my cohort of you know 35, 40 students. So I, I hope things are changing, and based on the trends that I've seen over the last two and a half years, things are. So it's encouraging. Fantastic. Thank you. Sorry, just a, a couple yeah. more signals that things I, I hope are changing is. Oftentimes, when a company's in velocity those first two years, they're making their first hire, their first and second hire. Sometimes they make ten hires. Um, the founders of those companies are thinking really, really hard about this. Um, it's more than more than a few times that I get a when a founder is about to make their first hire, they send to me, "Hey, this is our this is our policy on diversity. This is what we want to do in terms of equity. We really want to get this right. They they are testing to make sure that." Uh, the resumes and the CVs that they receive are reflective of what that community is out there. And if they see uh, too much in one direction, they challenge that, look for uh, postings and other, using other posting strategies to make sure that they can have uh, a broad cross-section of, of potential applicants. So my, my hope and my, is that the, the next round of companies that, that come out of this region uh, do it better. And in fact, our job to make sure that you have the inputs from universities and colleges to, that are represented as well. So a really important point. All right, so we are here now at 10 to 8. And uh, this is about the time when I wanted to hand over to you uh, with your questions for the panel. So I'm going to come around with the uh, microphone and uh, you can ask a question. Thanks. So I'm with you in the sense that we need to sort of expand a little bit more. But what I think is we also need to expand beyond the usual med. Um, so what's happening here is this is a med tech. But we're missing other important professions that actually feed into that as well. So I keep saying to everybody, we need a bigger table. It needs to be multi-generational. It needs to be multicultural. It needs to have people who are financial, medical, legal, etc. All sitting at that table where we're creating some of the software. And what I find is in Waterloo Region, we're so spoiled that all I have to do is step into Fergus or step into Port Lakes, and we won't even have these services available. So when you're saying think big, I'm thinking can we at least just even think across Canada and make some of these processes and systems so we can sort of integrate them. And the one thing, not a plug for my business, I want to say what it is, but the one thing I do in my business is integrate all those variables and those people and people are dying for it. That's the part they want the most. Not this silo, this silo, this silo. Comments from the panel? <coughs> Silent 
approaches? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I fully understand your question, but maybe I can tell you about some of the efforts that, uh, at least between the Accelerator Center and Communitech and, and Velocity, is that uh, we're working towards trying to harmonize and bring all the stakeholders to and tie them together, knit them together, uh, along with, with founders. Um, so you, you see Cam up here, you see me uh, in the in, in the audience wave is Nadia Banton. She's part of the Communitech team helping to tie this together. There's also Jacob George who's not here. So we're, we're doing the best we can to, to try and do this. And I'd encourage you just to maybe provide some suggestions and specific uh, things, tactical things we could do. And, and awesome. we'll try to do that. And definitely uh, reach out. Terrific. Terrific. Very insolent. If you're in water, this is fantastic. But if you're not in water, Forbid it. You can't get access to this stuff, right? That seems to be the big problem, is it's wonderful to be here, but even just go 10 kilometers outside of here and have your farm. Yeah, I will say that learning the entrepreneurial ecosystem within Kitchener Waterloo is a challenge in itself as someone as an outsider to the community. Um, I, like, I will say something that we're doing currently is creating uh, a wholesome ecosystem map for someone who wants to be an entrepreneur or is an entrepreneur and they need access to certain resources. We're literally trying to map that process out as we speak from a very basic marketing perspective. So we're trying to solve that problem. Fantastic, thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the enlightening and topic you all discussed today. Um, one of the points I would like to build is two of them. Question about uh, maybe dig and your connective brain on two topics, okay? Um, we all talk about diversity, gender, or male, or whatever uh, country people are made, come from their ancestor. But I think uh, what I'm curious is uh, to build what Adrienne was talking about is, uh, I think, an effort to people uh, to team up before they go into entrepreneurship so that they, because uh, when you go along, and you know, somebody told me, when you build a business, you need four legs, right? You need engineering, you need like, uh, Manufacturing, you need sales, you need you know, HR, whatever. So, so if you kind of build those capacity at the beginning, uh, at least at minimum, never allow an entrepreneur to start alone. You should. This is highly discourageable. And uh, question, just to verify that, you know, historically, a lot of long-lived company will start from a number of two, three, four, five people, and, and like and take Apple, take uh, all those big guys who live a long time. They start. Uh, at least two with a network of five core when they start, you know? And I think it's very important that you, uh, there's enough people in town to, uh, uh, mechanisms to people to line up, to encourage, and even if they have a beginning of an enterprise, to encourage them to try to uh, coalesce before they go to the money, because if me or him can raise, put a number, half a million together, we should be good for half, one, one and a quarter, because the synergy, right? You put four. So you don't think big, don't go alone for that. You know? I'm just saying, so question to you now, when you go and you, um, people who have started, is most of the time they alone or um, sometimes they two? What's the odds of people more than one? And is there anything about success rate, a longevity of an entrepreneur from the get-go, male, female, versus alone or together? Do you have any data on that? Uh, maybe I'll talk about the number of founders. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's generally well accepted that multiple founders uh, tend to have uh, at least uh, better early success because there's load balancing of work that needs to be done, there's commiseration around challenges, they're bouncing off of ideas. Um, uh, I, I, can, I know of at least two sole founders in, in the audience, and uh, I but that I, I know that they're both working really, really hard and I don't see them being unsuccessful. Um, I think part of what we can talk about too is if, if that sole founder is, is looking for another founder, how do, we, how do we make the connections in this area, right? We have, we have great technical talent coming out of university. Uh, we have great business talent coming out of the universities. Uh, but at least what we observe, and this is again something we're at least talking about with Communitech, is how do we get those words to collide, right? Um, and, and I think that you, I think yes, you've identified a challenge, and I, we do try and actively 
if a sole founder wants to find another founder, try to help a little bit here and there, make the connections, but at the end of the day, co-founding a company is such a, uh, an investment in one's life that finding that fit is, uh, is really, really important. The companies I tend to work with are a bit later stage, and I would say when they get to that point, they all have found a co-founder. Um, I can't think of a single company that I've had that's sort of at the million dollar plus mark that has not been, that has been a solo founder. Um, and, but in that regard too, like just because you have a co-founder doesn't mean you have all the resources you need. So you're not going to have, you know, two or three founders, you have limited resources, you're not going to know legal and accounting and HR and sales and marketing and engineering. So tap into the resources up here, right? Lean on us, we have professional partners who we can connect you with, who offer discounts or free services um, to help you fill those gaps until you have a company that can fill those gaps on its own. All right, thank you. And uh, another question here? Um, is there like, is there any reason to stay in Waterloo? Because the way you guys talk, uh, it seems like it's so much easier to just go to the valley. <laughs> but you'll have to live in your car. <laughs> So, so the valley, the valley is a great place to build networks and to raise capital. It can be a great place to root, to build a company, but access to talent in the valley is much more difficult than access to talent north of the border. So, um, the a great, a great strategy is is leverage the valley for what the valley is really great for. Um, return to KW or just return to Canada. Access talent because the universities here are in terms of talent creation on par or surpass that in the United States. Um, because when it comes time to build your company, talent will be the, the, the I should say scale your company, talent will be the, uh, the number one thing that I'm sure stresses up, at least the founders in town right now trying to scale. So um, maybe that, that could be a, I think Ken, maybe that'd be a good question for you to think about too. Yeah, so I echo a lot of things you just said, and I know that you touched on this earlier, so if you're a founder in town and there's something that you need that the United States can better provide, find an incubator, an accelerator that has access to those resources, find a way to get into that system and utilize the resources that the United States has, but at the end of the day, a lot of founders within the region start their businesses here, do that, they inject themselves within the US system, and at the end of the day, they end up moving back because it's cheaper, more cost effective, there's more talent, and they can utilize the resources that the incubators have provided them with in the United States. I can tell a really quick story too. There's one company uh, we work with at Communitech who's, they're at the scaling stage. They're at the like 20, 30 million dollar mark. And they opened an office uh, just south of San Francisco um, as a product development office specifically, and uh, in, you know, eight months, a bunch of that team had decided they wanted to move on because that's just what people do in San Francisco. They stay at a job for six or eight months and then you can go somewhere else and get a big promotion and get more money. So the turnover in talent, it wasn't worth keeping the office open, right? They moved that whole product development cycle back to KW. So I'm going to end it there. The message is stay here. <laughs> All right. All right. And, um, First of all, thank you very much uh, for a wonderful discussion. Um, just one comment before the question uh, on thinking big. So um, it's a quote from Elon Musk, and what he was saying in this was, uh, think of a problem that touches a lot of people and solve that problem. So when you solve that problem, uh, big money will come because it touches a lot of people and will generate a lot of cash flow. Okay, now to the question. So, we have talked a lot about uh, helping uh, the Gen Z that we're calling. But what about the older guys? <laughs> right? If older guys like myself who have a career, but they have ideas that they want to build on, what do they do? They cannot, like, uh, you know, uh, look into the resources from universities and colleges because they're not associated with them. Thank you. Thanks very much. I and I, I wonder if we could maybe, let, let's hear what Chris has to say. I'm going to hand it back to the uh, the Chris. <laughs> our, our doors are still open over there. <laughs>
Um, yeah, so we work with all different ages and stages of uh, ages of people, all different backgrounds, all different education, and all different stages of companies. I think our office is really a great landing spot for somebody who's got an idea with it, so our advisory services can help you with that and connect you to people that can actually push it forward for you. Thank you. Uh, what about the support from the universities and colleges? Like, are there any doors that people can knock on and, you know, get some uh, entrance into, like, you know, various programs? So, I guess what's common across all post-secondary education institutions these days, you're going to find schools will have some form of center for entrepreneurship, uh, uh, some form of center or, or research office. Uh, that again is meant to work with industry partners and so forth. So definitely it's just a matter of check out the website, find the appropriate center that will support again what you're looking for and make the inquiry. So reach out and we'll find a way to find an opportunity to work with you. So like I said earlier, uh, we, we are, we are uh, really pleased to have people, uh, it could be large companies, it could be entrepreneurs, it could be just somebody who's got an idea and would like to see what, what comes out of it, come to our students and say, here, innovate for me. And, and let our students do something on, on my behalf because it's a win-win in terms of them doing the innovation and so forth and the potential win for you in terms of getting something that might lead you to that next step. Uh, and uh, again, from there, you might then look at, again, the Accelerator Center, Minitech, and other uh, uh, incubators and so forth that can make, maybe hopefully get you to the next step afterwards in terms of funding and so forth. And to you, Adrian, find a way. Well, Velocity is open to anyone. Yeah. So it, it doesn't, you don't have to have any University of Waterloo affiliation to join the Velocity Incubator in downtown Kitchener. We have companies from Europe and the U.S. that have, that have moved here to incubate Velocity. Um, a lot of the founders, yes, are, are recent graduates from the University of Waterloo, but we have a variety of age levels in the, in the space as well. Thank you. And uh, our last question. Thanks. Uh, my name is Rocky J. Uh, first of all, thanks to all of you for your time. I know it's the evening and everyone will probably rather be at home with a glass of wine. Um, so I wanted to springboard off a lot of the other questions that have come up with respect to diversity, uh, but not uh, gender diversity or even cultural diversity. Um, we heard a little bit with regards to age diversity. We've heard uh, concerns about geographic diversity. Um, so I'm here as a tech person, but I'm also here representing someone uh, from a clinical perspective. And my question is on their behalf, um, so what, you know, there's, there's plenty of medical professionals and people focused in health, whether it's, um, you know, in, in geriatrics, in psychology, um, we know that uh, Emetros is, is, is in town, uh, Mary Pat Hinton's focused on uh, dementia. How do people that are in industry get involved? Because, like, everything here seems to be very focused on, you know, I'm a business person, entrepreneur. I'm a tech person, entrepreneur. And we talk about, well, we want to solve big problems. Great, but what about the problems that the, the staff that work in hospitals are having? And they say, you know, all I need is an iPad solution that's going to let me connect with my patient a lot better. How do they get those problems solved? First off, thanks to the plug on Emetros, great company. <laughs> um, no, it's great to hear the problem from the other perspective. Um, from, like, as you know, from the healthcare side, if you ever want, you individually or whoever it is in the crowd wants to get involved with the startup ecosystem, the great part of being in KW is say you come to me at the Accelerator Center and say, hey, my name's John, I really, really want to get involved with startups. Not only can I plug you in with our startups, I can plug you in with Communitech startups, Velocity startups, we kind of all work together. So finding that individual at each center, and I'm happy to connect with you afterwards and plug you in, finding that person and then letting them know your expertise, we're happy to plug you in. I think that's great. I guess my concern is um, people that have challenges and are trying to solve problems in health and med tech are not just in KW. Right? There's hospitals not just across Ontario, but across this country and everywhere. And how do they get connected? Are you thinking more like remote communities? Well, I wouldn't consider London remote or no. Woodstock remote, <laughs> but I mean, I'm just wondering, like, there's hospitals all around Southern Ontario. Um, I know, like, a, my, help, my, my friend is connected with Tanya with respect to the Hack for Health uh, event that's coming up, but that's just because I was able to connect. 
<coughs> but there's plenty of other help and, and professionals in the industry that have no way to find you. So, so can I just step in here because I think, uh, in fact, in many cases now, a lot of healthcare organizations are actually developing entrepreneurship programs, as in, they will have an innovation center within their organization. The perfect one that comes to mind is St. Elizabeth Healthcare, focused on home care. They have a group who looks at nothing but new innovations for their organization and supporting them, even from an idea up. So uh, if your organization as a healthcare provider doesn't have that kind of opportunity, then you know, connecting in with some of the resources here I think is a great place to start, but so too is uh, connecting in with a lot of the resources that the local, uh, that the, uh, local uh, um, uh, uh, health integration network has. And we here at, so in this, uh, this region have a really innovative local health inter in integration network. They are really focused on new <coughs> innovations and have actually supported financially that kind of research and development. So it's not the same with all of them, but it's there. The other thing is just a, a plug for the province of Ontario, who has a health technologies fund that's managed through the Ontario Centers of Excellence. They too are also doing this. Also looking to national centers of excellence uh, that are supported by the uh, Tri Council. Many of them now are you know, investing in these research centers who have money to be able to support people. I know with the A12 network, we actually run a hackathon. And I teach at the Summer Institute, where I teach researchers and students from all sorts of different disciplines to come together to work on an idea and to develop a pitch for it. So I, I think, you know, there are probably a lot of ideas that the folks up here have. I could help, I'd be happy to chat with you about what some of the opportunities are, but they, there are a lot of them now. And um, so, so again, it's just uh, keeping your, uh, your mind open and then being prepared to network to find those resources. So with that, sorry. Okay. Yes, go ahead. I haven't taken the mic in one of these in a long time. Um, we are, we, we are hacking up what are we doing? And there are 44, 44, at least 44 chapters in packing house around the globe. And we are connected to just about every hospital. Um, I, will, I will confidently say the world. So if there's somebody, something that you want to get in touch with, John and I may not know them, but we have an incredible connection uh, for you guys to tap in, for everybody to tap into. Okay, so uh, with that, this ends the question and answer period. I'd encourage you all to stay, um, connect with our guest speakers and with everybody else in the audience. And I'm going to hand this over to John now to thank our uh, group. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much. I think that was a hugely informative panel. Please don't leave. Just yet. Thank you, Josie, for expertly uh, moderating that. It was great. And thank you so much to everyone uh, on that panel. Um, I think Hacking Health Waterloo, as I said at the beginning, wants to be a connector in the region. And I think with that in mind, we also do want to direct you to uh, other kind of related uh, events. So the Hack for Health, uh, which comes up starting on the 28th of uh, September. Uh, and actually, I'm going to invite up now um, Shirley Fenton, uh, who can uh, say a little bit uh, about the Waterloo MedTech Conference, which is on October 24th uh, next month. Okay, thank you. Well, I know that uh, I'm between you and walking out the door, I guess, or networking with everybody else here, so I'll be brief. Uh, just to let you know that uh, we're going to hold, we being Waterloo MedTech, we too are a startup, we're in, just in our second year. We're part of the puzzle here, a piece of the puzzle of trying to build our MedTech community. And to that end, we are holding our third annual Waterloo Region MedTech Conference on October the 24th, that's Wednesday, in Waterloo at St. George Hall. On each of the tables, I did try to put uh, one of our programs, uh, but I think a lot of them have disappeared. I'm sorry, I would have brought more copies if I had known. Uh, just to walk you through the program, uh, what we try to do is to bring in experts from around the world, uh, but also to showcase who's doing what here in our community. The theme of this conference, it seems so amazing that it just melds into what you folk were talking about. 
Uh, we're, the theme of the conference this year is Canadian MedTech. What's holding us back? And I guess each one of us has uh, part of the answer to that, or at least a question that you'd like to ask about that. So just to walk through the program, the whole purpose is to learn from each other, hence we're bringing in experts from around the world. Uh, we want to share our spotlight so that people in Toronto, Ottawa, across Canada know what we're doing here because we want to build our community from good to great in terms of MedTech. So in terms of uh, international speakers, we've got someone coming from John Hopkins uh, Medical um, Innovation Center. <coughs> Uh, talking about how they deal with startups. We've got an international speaker coming from Europe talking about what, what are they doing in Europe and how, do they, how are they handling uh, to get uh, startups to scale ups. Uh, we've got um, speak experts from industry, uh, for example, uh, Medtronic Canada, the president of Medtronic Canada will be speaking. We've got people coming from healthcare. Let's face it, if the docs don't want to use our medtech, uh, innovations, it's not going to fly. So we've got, we've got to bring them, embrace them in, in this community. So we've got the past president of the College of Physicians and Surgeons to talk. We have uh, great uh, academics coming, for example, from the University of Toronto, Joe Cafazzo. Some of you may know him. He developed, I think, one of Canada's best medtech apps uh, that help uh, juveniles and, and young people with their diabetes. It's a great app, great example. He'll talk to, me, to, to us about his experience. We have two panels, more or less along what was being discussed here, uh, but uh, with uh, people from across Canada as some of the speakers, but also speakers from our area. Uh, we will be announcing the top seven innovators from our startups, uh, our startups from our incubators and accelerator centers and they will be giving their pitches at the conference. Our conference plenary is Ontario's uh, Chief Healthcare Strategist, uh, Dr. Ruben Devlin. I think everybody wants to know what is Ontario going to do in terms of healthcare. So maybe we'll get a few hints from him. Uh, we have uh, a networking exam uh, a reception, so a great place to come and network, an exhibitor hall, so if you want to exhibit your, what you're doing, uh, please uh, uh, let me know and we'll try to get you involved in the, uh, in the exhibit hall. There will be a startup alley in the exhibit hall, so we're really looking at startups being part of the exhibit area. But we also want our mature companies here to be part of the exhibit hall so that we can showcase who we are already. So that gives you just a, a bit of a, an overview of the, the, uh, the conference. Oh, I, I'd be amiss if I didn't say that we also will have uh, some of our startups that have got to scale up and how they got along that path. So we'll learn from their experiences. So I hope you will come and join us. Uh, registration is open. Uh, we've tried to keep the cost down as best we can, uh, but uh, it'd be great to see many of you at our conference. So that's it. If you have any questions, I'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you, Shirley. Yeah, we, we do very much want to help promote, whether it be at Full Health, Waterloo MedTech, and others might have picked up. So there's a cooperathon, uh, which actually starts uh, in uh, Waterloo, or actually starts across the country uh, on September the 28th, and they're looking at uh, four areas, which is health, education, finance, and energy. If anyone's interested in that, we will post it through the uh, Hacking Health uh, Meetup uh, group, so you can find uh, information about that as well. So that concludes uh, our evening, but uh, part of the purpose of Hacking Health Waterloo and Hacking Health really is networking. Uh, tonight, there's probably more pizza left, I suspect, uh, but also connecting afterwards. So please do uh, either use the Meetup group uh, or either. I don't know, Twitter, LinkedIn, or whatever it is appropriate uh, to continue the conversations and make uh, new connections. We hope you come back. Uh, you will also see, receive a survey uh, from us uh, about uh, this event tonight and the panel and really where we should go in terms of who else you would like to, to hear from. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, hope we see you again uh, in a month's time. Uh, and please follow that meetup group. Thank you.
Thank you. Good night. Good job.